and for the, the Zoom, oh, I forgot it does that, it's very loud. Um, for the Zoom functionality, um, if you're okay to keep yourselves muted, um, but if you would like to ask any questions throughout, um, feel free to either turn on your camera and put your hand up or um, use the function to, to raise your hand in the reactions um, section along the bottom row there. So, um, I'll just go through a bit of uh, the content. So if we could have the next slide, please, Alan. That's great. So yeah, just the, the content of this meeting, um, we've we've got in until half past seven. Um, it may not take quite that long. We'll see how we go. Um, but I'll give a bit of an introduction to the project team. Um, I'll talk through the aims of this event. Uh, and then Alan is going to take us on to the introduction of the strategy what the strategy is and the aims of it um, and then he'll give an overview of each of the uh, strategy areas looking at the individual issues for each area uh, within that and then John will take us into the strategy development approach uh, looking at the yeah the sort of staged approach that we're taking and how um, I'll then talk a bit about how stakeholder engagement can help inform the FSM strategy and um, crucially how you can get involved so yeah we could have the next slide please Alan that's great. So who's on the call tonight? So um, we've got myself, Dan Williams, and we have Alan Frampton uh, from BCP Council. Alan is the Flood and Coastal Erosion Risk Management Strategy Policy and Environment Manager, and he's the, the Client Project Manager for this strategy. Uh, and we have John Short as well from Consultancy ACOM, and he is the Consultant Project Manager. So we could have the next slide, please, Alan. And we also have Nikki here from, from the Dorset Case Forum in the background. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so the aims of this event, um, firstly, we just really like to raise awareness of the work being done on this project. Um, so the aim is really to develop the Portland Underhill to White Regis flood and coastal risk management strategy. <clears throat> and we'll be looking at how and when we'll be engaging as well. So looking at community engagement and how people can get involved in this. Um, and then also we would like to seek some initial feedback um, and some input from stakeholders um, to help us inform the strategy going forwards. Um, so this information will help us understand the, the key issues for stakeholders and the local community. Um, and this isn't just the community within the strategy area, but anyone who might be affected um, in the surrounding area. Understanding the constraints and opportunities um, for delivering these wider benefits from a stakeholder perspective. Um, I'm sure there'll be many different perspectives of that. And then understanding the concerns regarding uh, coastal flood risk and erosion and landsliding issues um, and working alongside different projects who are working on that within the area as well. And then finally, understanding the potential partnership funding sources. Um, so Alan will go on to discuss this, um, but this is yeah key to, to sort of looking at the future funding of these works. So I will hand over to Alan now. Uh, thanks very much, Alan. Oh, yes, we have a, a quick poll, actually, which Nikki's going to put up. And um, we'll have a few of these throughout the session. Um, so it should be popping up on your screen now. So if you're happy to select just how you heard about this event today, that'd be really helpful. Perfect. That's great. Amazing. We do have quite a, a small group of us today. So yeah, feel free to jump in with um, questions. And <clears throat> if you have any comments, feel free to use the chat as well. That's great. Perfect. So over to you, Alan. Yeah. Oh, so I just popped up on my screen. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to firstly introduce just the strategy area, just to set the scene um, background to the area we're looking at. So on screen now is the red line denotes uh, our limits of the area we're looking at. So we're covering uh, Portland Underhill from on the line base side from the West Weir's wall stabilisation scheme going northwestwards along Chesil Beach to broadly opposite the Chesil Vista Holiday Park. And then we come across to the northern side of the Holiday Park um, along the shoreline of the fleet and around Smallmouth to the southern end of the Rodwell Trail. And then we'll come along the Portland Harbour shore along Ham Beach around Osprey Quay and Castletown up to the boundary of Portland Port. So this area's got a lot of con in 
conflicting and competing interests. So we've got a lot of nature conservation designations, many of which have legal status. Um, we've got national and international designations, including World Heritage Site, um, uh, and SACs and SPAs and triple SIs, et cetera. So we have to be mindful of anything we do and the impacts on those environmental features. We've also got um, designated water bodies um, for shell fisheries uh, in Portland Harbor as well. And we've got lots of historic and cultural interest, including scheduled monuments, archeological sites, et cetera. Again, uh, some of which have legal um, status and need to be thought about in the combination with the other features in the area. Underpinning everything we do is understanding how the coastal processes in the physical environment um, are acting to drive coastal evolution in the area. We look to understand the sediment transport processes, the wave climate, the tides, the currents, etc. Um, and we do have since 2007 consistent monitoring, particularly on the Chesil Beach side of the area from the uh, Southwest Regional Coastal Monitoring Programme. So there's uh, our main interests of understanding how, what are the risks from flooding, the different routes to flooding in the area and also erosion. So this is some, showing some national mapping that currently exists. So the blue areas in the central part are the Environment Agency's flood zone map showing the present day flood zone area. Um, you might notice the, the shape around Osprey Key doesn't look uh, quite matched shoreline in that area and that's because that mapping hasn't been updated for a little while so as part of this project we'll be doing some new flood modeling and mapping to give us an up-to-date assessment both for present day and um, longer term and then at the west weirs area and the northern parts around the holiday park there are some coastal erosion risks as well that we need to um, be thinking about so this is just illustrating the fact that this area has a long history of um, flood events. We've gone back to the November 1824 Great Gale, um, where um, 80 houses was destroyed and 26 people drowned um, as a result of um, a, a significant storm event um, in the area. And then you can see here there were lots of flood events in the past. Um, and actually coastal and flood defences weren't installed into the late 50s, early 1960s in here. Um, and even then you can see we still had flooding events. The most recent notable ones were really in 2014 um, when we had a series of storm events and we had flooding of about six properties in, in Chisel and closing of the uh, beach road on a number of occasions. At West Weirs, we've got... Um, cliff stability landslide risks to be mind mindful of. So there is an existing seawall and stabilization system managing that risk at the moment, but we need to look at um, how we maintain that uh, in the long term and what are the risks posed. So this is um, a diagram from some recent works Dorset Council commissioned um, to better understand the processes at work and the uh, geotechnical situation of that system. Chesil Beach itself, uh, there's uh, various views on, on how it's evolved and will evolve in the future, but there is a view that, that the beach could roll back towards Portland Harbour at some, some point, largely driven by infrequent big storm events. So it's not a gradual change, but it will be um, sudden and sporadic. Um, so this was just some projections of what where the beach might be over a hundred year period and um, you may notice around the area just north of where the little roundabout is on the beach road, this would suggest there is a possibility the beach could be sat on top of the road um, within 100 years. So we're going to be looking at a little bit more as part of this project to understand what is the nature of the risk and what might the responses be. And our starting point for the strategy is, is um, building on the work that is in a document called the Shoreline Management Plan that was um, produced and adopted by councils in the Environment Agency back in 2011. And that set out the long-term vision and series of policies over time for the next 100 years to how that is achieved. What we're doing with the strategy is taking a sub area of that shoreline management plan and, and looking in more detail, how do we implement those adopted policies in a technically, environmentally and economically sustainable way. And that will involve considering all the 
more recent guidance and evidence that's come about since the SMP as well in, in sense checking those SMP policies in the process. So just mention the SMP is one document, but there are lots of other uh, overlapping plans and studies, etc., in the area that are listed here that we'll also be looking at um, as well. Uh, there's a couple of key ones to note that um, Dorset Council are currently doing some more work on the West Weirs wall, um, looking at uh, options for um, upgrading that in the near term and also at the Portland Harbour Northwest Shore. So the boundary of this strategy on the World World Trail abuts an uh, ongoing project. Um, the Dorset Council leading there, looking at the options for managing the erosion along the Portland Harbour shore. So I mentioned the shoreline management plan. This is just a map showing what are currently the shoreline management plan policy units and the colours denote the 100 year policy. So in 100 years time, this is what the best shoreline management plan suggests the policy will be. The blue is to continue to defend, hold the line. The red uh, where on Long Chesil Beach is a managed realignment policy, um, managing the risk posed by potential for the beach rolling back in that area and its potential impacts on the road and towards Portland Harbour. And then northwards, um, you'll see the green area that has a policy of no active intervention and that doesn't expect any intervention, no new defences being built and allowing nature to um, take its course in the coast to evolve naturally. So as I said, that, that's the SMP policies are our start point for developing the strategy. And we've set out this is our aim is to develop the uh, approach to implementing those policies over the next 100 years in a sustainable, integrated, and should probably have added adaptable uh, way um, over time as well. Um, we'll be following national guidance, something called the Flooding Coastal Erosion Risk Management Appraisal Guidance that's produced by the Environment Agency and DEFRA, which sets out how we have to do these types of projects and what we can and can't include in our appraisal. And we'll be using the latest climate change projections and sea level rise guidance um, from UK Climate Projections 18 um, as well. So that's all available online, but that, that is the core of our the climate change projections we'll be using. And everything we do needs to meet the standards um, and uh, requirements so that we can get this strategy approved and uh, adopted, uh, uh, approved by something called the Large Project Review Group, which is the Environment Agency's assurance um, process. And having that assurance and sign off lets us then progress to developing schemes that the strategy identifies as being needed um, relatively easily. So. To achieve the aims, we're going to be producing at the end of this project a strategy document, um, an appraisal report, and all the evidence we develop along the way will be provided as part of that. We'll be conducting a strategic environmental assessment, habitats regulation assessment, marine conservation zone assessment, and water framework directive assessment to comply with the various environmental legislation um, around that. Once we've identified our leading options um, towards the end of the project, we'll, we'll do an initial calculation of what the potential carbon footprint of those options are as, a, as an initial baseline. We'll be looking at the economic impacts of flooding and erosion, if we did nothing, and then what if we do different manage, take different management decisions uh, in the future. So the FSOM appraisal guidance that we follow nationally lets us count certain things within that economic case, but we will also be looking at the wider economic benefits to air in something called a gross value added analysis. So looking at the value of the road, for example, and the impacts of it being closed periodically because of flooding has quite a big impact on a wider area than just what we're looking at in the strategy area. So considering those kind of questions, we'll be assessing the current condition and the life expectancy of the various coastal defenses along the frontage at the moment. As I mentioned, we'll be undertaking new flood mapping, modeling and mapping as well uh, for present day and future. And part of the outputs so of this project will set out a forward plan of what studies, projects, schemes, et cetera, are needed over the next five, 10, 20 years. And where we have funding gaps identified, um, identifying um, how we might fill those through bringing together different funding partners over time.
what strategy won't do and and we've put this slide in because these kind of questions come up quite often when i do these kind of projects so having a strategy in place won't guarantee we'll get the funding from central government or others to deliver the activities but it makes the case for for it and it make we'll have to go on to write a more detailed business case for schemes etc but this gets the ball rolling and, and um, makes that process a lot easier we won't be defining the local plan policies in this but we are liaising with the the planners at dorset council who are developing the new dorset local plan to make sure any emerging policy issues etc or current policies are considered we don't um set policy around coastal access uh, we're aware that there are concerns around for example some of the coast path routes and diversions that's not what this po project is about but we will be cognizant of the potential impacts of different management choices uh, on on coastal access and we don't change environmental designations the, the designated sites i showed uh, earlier are what they are this process isn't about changing those boundaries of those sites um, as well so we'll be considering the interaction between flood and coastal risk management options and those kind of features of the area um, and how they may be impacted positively or negatively as we do this, but we're not actually setting um, options around them. So it's point for pause questions. Any questions, Dan? No, looks like we can move on, I think. Okay. Thank you. So this next section, I'm just going to, uh, in pr preparing this project, we, we undertook uh, a scoping study last year. And in doing that, we, we divided the strategy up into a number of units just for ease of talking about them and thinking about them. So these next slides uh, break the coast up into those units for the time being these units might change as the strategy develops um and we we develop the evidence we might we might adjust some of these but uh so that's the basis of how i'm going to talk about this next section so the first of those units is west weirs chisel and chisel beach um so the lime bay side of the strategy area effectively and this area has a number of smp policy units which are shown on the map um, the two southernmost ones have a policy to um, continue to defend, hold, I'm oh, sorry, the, the southernmost ones, um, once you get beyond the West Weir's wall, is to allow the coast of uh, the Isle of Portland to evolve naturally. Then when we come into the 6A02, where the um, existing sea walls, coastal defences are, the, the flood defence system is, the policy there is to continue to maintain that and provide a defence there. Uh, into the future. Then 6A03 is about managed realignment, managing how the impacts of how the beach may evolve, may suddenly change alignment as a result of a storm. Uh, and then going northwards in, along the fleet is back to allowing the coast to evolve naturally. So the, the defence system we have in that 6A02 unit is quite um, complicated and quite unique. So this is a bit of an overview. We've got seawalls developed and built over a number of decades in different phases. We've got slope stabilization measures. We've got drainage uh, and culverts, etc., along the way. So the next few slides just try to explain that in a bit more detail. Um, at West Weirs, um, you, we've got um, in the upper slope, there's drains uh, diverting um, rainfall groundwater into, into a series of um, culverts and chambers that flow out below the seawall uh, at the seawall at the toe um, and that seawall is adding weight to the base of that um, slope as well. Coming along the um, what is the um, quiddle section and, and towards the cave house in we've got um, seawall that was built in the late 50s early 60s it was then um, further upgraded and, and encapsulated by um, the current seawall that was built in the 1980s when the concrete steps were added and we had the wave return sections added as well. That, uh, so that's the section running along Brandy Row, etc. And then from about the Cove House in going northwestwards, um, there's a big problem historically with water 
just coming through the beach called percolation uh, and causing flooding. And so as part of the 1980s um, scheme, a sheet pile wall was built at the back of the beach and a big open coal, a big culvert buried beneath the beach and water flowing through the beach rather than coming out the back and causing flooding into the village is actually diverted into that culvert and that then flows along back uh, the back of the beach um, towards the Masonic car park and the crest of the beach in that area there are a series of gabions referred to as the gabion mattress which are designed um, to stop the top crest height of the beach lowering when we get waves coming over the top of it um, and that did work really well in 2014. We did get damaged to those gabions, but the, the crest height didn't reduce. And that water flowing through that culvert that's buried beneath the beach that you can't see is what comes out here at what is known as the windows into the open channel. And that water, when it does flow, runs down through this channel towards um, Portland Harbour and it discharges uh, under the road through the series of culverts um, that, that are there into Portland Harbour. And one of the actual challenges in 2014 was the tide height at Portland Harbour um, stayed high for a while and the water couldn't drain out so easily, so it caused um, flooding um, or added to the flooding problem. So that's a question we need to think about for this strategy. And then this is just the map, a map indicating kind of the different flooding pathways we have to think about for the strategy so we've got water coming through the beach we've got water coming over the beach um, as well uh, and we've got wave over topping and from wave run up at west Weirs, we've got the risk of that landslide system being reactivated should the existing system fail and then i mentioned the potential for the beach moving towards um, portland harbour as well and just a reminder, the, some pictures from the 2014 storms when we had a significant amount of water coming over the wall um, and causing flooding of the roads, flooding in, of the highway, both in Chisel Village and the uh, Portland Beach Road. Uh, and we had beach lowering when we got down to bed levels and a hole um, formed in part of the wall along the quiddle section there with a small child for scale. So... Pause there if there's any questions. Yeah, so if anyone does have any questions, feel free to come off mute and, and speak up. No, I think it looks like we can move on, Alan. Okay. So moving on, so the next few around on the Portland Harbour side, so we're going to start at Castletown. So the, our boundary, as I said, is the um, Portland Port boundary on the eastern, the right-hand side of the map on screen. Um, the shoreline management plan policy here is to continue to defend through hold the line for the 100 years. So the, the options here are about what, what needs to happen uh, and who needs to take action to man manage defences, raise defence levels, etc. over time. Um, so those kind of questions we'll be thinking about. There are a mix of ownership and responsibilities for the assets here. So we'll we'll look to firstly identify what kind of levels are we talking about over what time scales, and then we'll be needed looking to engage with the relevant asset owners, operators in this area. Um, and part of the challenge there as well, we've obviously got Portland Castle, which is a, a historic feature that we need to be cognizant of in, in this as well. In terms of the flood risk, again, this is present day flood risk um, mapped by the environment agency so it is obviously constrained by the fact that the ground levels rise quite rapidly behind this area but there is a risk to the seaward facing properties and also potentially to the the access road to the port um, longer term um, but it'll be primarily driven by um, sea level rise uh, rather than wave action because of the sheltered nature of this section now moving that round to Osprey here again, the, the SMP policy here is to continue to defend. Um, you've got the added protection at the moment for the marina in this area. Um, responsibilities for these assets are with the landowner, um, but we need to think about and, and engage with them to understand what actions they may need to be thinking about and what timescales and how that interplays with the wider 
system in, in flood defences. And around the back of Osprey Key, we've got the armoured banks that were installed to protect it against flooding coming through and over Chesil Beach on the other side of the road. And the armouring is there because you will get fast flowing water that would uh, probably quite rapidly erode um, just plain earth embankments. So that, those gabions are there to, for that reason. And at the northern end of this section, um, the top left pictures there are the drain from the uh, chisel scheme where it flows through that open ditch and then under the road through these um, six box culverts into Portland Harbour. And the bottom left is the channel that is formed um, as that water's flown out. And then in Victoria Square, we've got uh, a culvert, again, water that floods into Victoria Square. Goes, is diverted in part into this drain and that takes it out through another buried um, channel into Portland Harbour. And you can see this whole area is actually in flood zone um, if we didn't have any defences. Um, important point here, the yellow arrow, the helipad uh, runway is actually de designed to be a uh, flood pathway. So when we get flooding from the Lime Bay side, water can be diverted into that channel towards Portland Harbour. And if you know the area, you will know that the heliport has got some big floodgates um, along one side of it that they close when they get a flood warning from the Environment Agency. So again, I'll pause there for questions. Yeah, uh, Jeff Kirby here. Um, I was just wondering, I've lived in Weymouth for 60 years. I don't ever remember any significant flooding coming up from the marina side. Even in 2014, I don't think there was any water coming up onto the heliport around there, uh, simply because there wasn't an easterly gale at the time, which was causing a surge in the harbour. I wonder how serious the risk is on that side of the harbour. Um, I might answer that on the next set of slides, because we've, we've got some projections of what sea level rise, current, the current climate sea level projections we're using mean on the Portland Harbour side. So maybe if I come to that in a moment, but it'll be more st still water risk and just the gradual rising with sea level, which could be an issue um, in places. It depends on our defense levels, et cetera. Um, so maybe if I come to the next slides, that might answer your question. If that's all right. Is there any others before I move on to that? Because <laughs> I think it will help in a minute. Okay, so I'll move Great. on. Um, so yeah, the Ham Beach section, um, again, the policy in the SNP here is um, to continue to defend, um, but suggesting maybe long term, we might need to think about exactly what, how that's done um, to counter the rising sea levels. Um, at the moment, you can, if you go along there, you've got uh, old um, riprap revetment um, that has failed in places and on the right conditions, as Jeff was saying, uh, probably even days like today when we've had high tides and strong easterlies, you get the wave action that can then nibble away at the footpath. And so you're starting to get erosion through that bank and the sea level rise that and we get the right conditions that could happen more frequently. Uh, and then we've got the marina site and the concrete revetment um, at the southern, at the, sorry, the northern end of this unit. And our flood risk, we've got potential for wave wave action is, is relatively minimal, but on the right conditions, you do get wave action. Um, and if you get it combined with high water, um, high water levels are going to be rising with sea level rise, cause an issue. We're going to look at that in more detail as part of this project. And then obviously you've got risk of flooding and, and beach migration as well from the Lion Bay side to this one. So that it's uh, the the road is the key feature in this area from a sort of infrastructure wider economic value um, impact. So it could be subject to a pincer movement, I guess, is the way to think about it. And and to Jeff's question just now about the sea level rise. So we took one section um, through this area. Uh, the red line is the present day mean high water springs. The, um, which one is it? The, yeah, the yellow line is the present day one in 200 extreme level that we designed to. And then we've added uh, about one, just over one meter of sea level rise to these, which is what the core projection we use is. You can see in a hundred years, your mean high water spring will be more or less the same as a pr current 
day one in 200 extreme and then your one in 200 extreme which is what our typical design level is when we think about designing um standard of protection or standard of service will be well above the embankment level so you could be potentially uh getting more frequent flooding and this is just a core projection if we we have to sensitivity test with an upper and lower band the upper limit would be higher than this as well so that's our that's the concern we have in this area and it will depend on what the current defense levels are that whether how press how um soon that issue is is like to rise around different bits of the Portland Harbour side. Um, so, so if I just pause there, I hope does that answer your question, Jeff? If that's right, if I ask. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. I'm okay. sorry, I've I've got an unstable internet connection here. I may go in and out. I'm afraid. Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. No, that, that's fine. I just want to make sure I answered your question. I just knew that slide was coming up. Um, so, um, okay. So moving on, the next unit we have is is the uh, fleet side of um, of, of uh, the causeway from the south side of the uh, fleet entrance to the visitor center. Um, again, here, um, this is where it gets a little bit messy in shoreline management plan terms because uh, it's not quite clear which which of the policies apply, um, whether it's the one on the Portland Harbour side or the one on the Lime Bay side. So it might be as a result of this project, we actually go back to the SMP and modify that. So that's something we're going to think about as well, just to give that clarity. Um, uh, but along here, we've got the wall, which um, protects the highway. And again, it's got to be the right conditions, high tide plus wind coming from the right direction. And you can get um, spray over topping particularly happens fairly regularly along that section is, is evidenced by the picture on the bottom right, which is was in 20, uh, February 2022 there as well. And that, again, with rising sea levels could happen more frequently and also probably at some point start um, exceeding the current crest level. So we need to think about that working with the highways colleagues uh, at Dorset Council. And again, this is just illustrating the, the flood risk in that area and it, it's it's high high extreme tides uh, and combined with um, wind driven waves uh, causing that kind of overtopping risk is our concern. I'll, I'll carry on because that was quite short. Um, the north side of that area on the fleet, so running along um, from the entrance to, to the fleet up to the north side of the holiday park, um, Again, the policy here is uh, moving between um, hold the line and that to intervention. Again, the SMP isn't necessarily quite as clear as it could be, so we'll probably we'll look to clarify that um, as part of this pr process and go back to the SMP to make it clear in that document once the strategy is updated. Um, along a lot of that section, the lower lying part from the entrance to the fleet to about the crab house cafe if you know the area there's a uh, mixture of concrete revetments the substantive revetment there is protecting the water infrastructure operated by wessex water including the pumping station which um, is linked to the the infrastructure that goes across to portland and here we've got two two primary risks we've got a little bit of flood risk at present day which might increase over time with sea level rise so that's something we need to think about and then as you go around the caravan park, the ground raises and we have potential coastal erosion, or well, we already have coastal erosion happening there because the coast paths have to be closed and diverted. Um, I think it's currently closed along there as well by the crab house. Um, so what is the risk there of erosion? What might that do to outflanking the uh, concrete revetment? We need to think about those kind of issues as well and, and what are the implications for the caravan site? Holiday park. Um, and then on the opposite side there, our last unit is coming round into Smallmouth, uh, the beach there in the southern end of the Rodwell Trail. Again, the SMP policy here is to continue to defend um, over time, raising defence levels as appropriate, etc. And yeah, we've got rock revetment, um, seawall in this area, the main, main defence is provided. And then there's some rock revetment along the south side of the Rodwell Trail, again, thinking about how that might need to be managed um, to prevent that um, ground being eroded and or um, 
is there a flood risk there under the right conditions of high tide longer term? We need to answer to those kind of questions. Um, and you can see that erosion risk and uh, illustrated on this diagram here. So if we do nothing, the national, the, the erosion risk mapping um, would suggest that we will get erosion of the Rodwell Trail and would lose that feature potentially. So that uh, could then lead to flooding into the um, housing development there behind. So we need to think about those kind of questions. So I think that's probably my last slide. So questions at this point. You're on mute, Dan. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Alan. That's great. Really good overview of all of the areas. Um, I think we're good for questions at the moment. So I think it's on okay. to John for a little bit now. Ooh, I forgot ah, yeah. Down. Quick poll. <laughs> Quick poll. <laughs> Always sneak up on us. Great. So I think, Nick, if you're happy to put that up, that'd be great. There we go. Amazing. So uh, if you could just select which areas you're most interested in um, from that list there, that'd be really helpful. Oh, great. Yeah, you can scroll down as well um, and you can, yeah, you can select all of the above equally as well if, if that's the case. I'll just give it a minute. Perfect. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Perfect. So we'll move on. So I think over to you, John. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to talk to you a bit about the actual process of and stages of development of the project and of the strategy. So um, you can see we, we started a bit earlier uh, in the summer and we're currently in stage one of an eight stage process to um, to basically build on the issues and understand the issues further that Alan's taken us through. So in stage one, we've been collecting data, undertaking the survey site walkover, uh, and also assessing any potential gaps in uh, information and data that we may need and may require to allow us to start developing options and appraising options uh, as we go through the process. And uh, this initial round of engagement uh, with yourselves uh, and also the uh, sort of physical exhibitions that we held is a key part of that just looking to understand um, from yourselves uh, and other stakeholders really what the interests issues opportunities etc are so that stage will take us um, through the next few weeks looking to finalize those initial tasks before we then move into stage two which is um, really around setting the objectives um, and and the sort of critical success factors really for the strategy so that we're ensuring that as we're developing potential options and appraising those we're we're, we're tying back to them and ensuring that they are um, driving towards the outcomes that the strategy is looking to achieve uh, also as part of that as key environmental baselining to um, just really set out those environmental constraints and opportunities for the strategy as well as um, strategic environmental assessment screening and scoping really just to frame those key environmental uh, themes and issues that the strategy needs to be cognizant of as we develop options establishing the baseline scenario then uh, comes next as part of stage three where we really build on um, the evidence and information and studies that have been uh, carried out to date to give us an up-to-date baseline of coastal processes and our understanding of flood and coastal uh, erosion along the frontage. We've got a good understanding to date, but really making sure that we're building in those latest uh, projections of climate change, sea level rise, and latest information and data into that sort of key modeling task, which will support not only the understanding um, of those risks, but also potential options that we have to then look at managing them going forward. That also supports a damage assessment. So the, the economic case uh, is obviously a key part of the justification that looking for the case for change and for supporting um, the development and management options and future schemes. So 
um, that modeling will then feed an updated damage assessment, which Alan touched on earlier, which will also look at some of the wider benefits that the strategy may potentially bring, as well as the sort of more traditional national loss uh, damages for the strategy. That's also supported by a, a second round of engagement. Really, then we move through stages four, five, and six, which is developing um, the options that we have for the various different units that Alan has described, uh, looking to initially cast the net quite wide and um, understand all the potential uh, long list of options, uh, in management interventions, actions, adaptation that we could uh, look to appraise uh, as we then whittle those down to a short list of um, options which are worthy of more detailed appraisal across the range of economic, environmental and general sustainability and technical considerations. There's a further um, round of engagement on the long list options in stage four and also on the short list of options in stage five. We'll then, once we have those short list of options confirmed uh, and agreed, move through that detailed appraisal um, to produce a, a short list option report. Uh, which will then um, again be subject to consultation in, in stage seven where we're identifying the leading options uh, and particularly now um, a move to really identify potential adaptive pathways so that the potential management options that, that we have going forward in time over the short, medium and long term, which is supported by the various technical reports as well as a strategic environmental assessment report uh, an assessment against the habitats regulations and the water framework directive as well as well as the marine um, conservation zone assessment so quite rigorous environmental reporting that um, goes alongside the technical and economic uh, and other associated reports we'll have a formal 12-week consultation on the draft strategy at that point uh, obtain that feedback which will then um, be evaluated and assessed and where need be fed back into an update and sort of finalization of the strategy in stage eight and the uh, sort of formal reporting um, will be carried out so a star document which is a strategic um, uh, basically a, a summary of the strategy that gets put forward with the various technical appendices which goes to the environment agency's large project re review group or LPRG who uh, sort of a national body for um, evaluating and providing assurance and recommendation for um, strategy approval uh, and there'll be a final round of engagement uh, round six uh, of engagement to disseminate that final strategy which will be uh, on the current program uh, aiming for spring or so early summer 2026 so I appreciate it's uh, quite a long program there's an awful lot of stages and work to get through um, there and obviously there's potential for change but uh, that's the current uh, plan that we're working to next a couple of slides is just to expand a bit on the work we've carried out to date over the last few months uh, and also what's next so um, initial tasks have been to uh, undertake the site walkovers uh, and surveys uh, really plan the project, uh, undertake that data collection and review and gap analysis, uh, reviewing those previous uh, reports um, uh, and data to ensure that we have ev the evidence and the information we need to support the development of the, pl of the strategy uh, and appraisal of options. We've carried out a targeted survey of um, assets to update and gain information on their condition the current um, condition which supplements existing information um, so a desktop um, sorry a, a defense condition report has been drafted and is currently being finalized we've been developing our plans for engagement and undertaking those initial uh, public exhibitions and the webinar that we're on now as part of that stage one um, sort of data review and, and collection phase um, and then also making a start on the modeling task so really that um, is expanded a bit further on the next stage but looking to set out and get agreement on the required numerical modeling that we need to support the strategy and the approach that we'll be adopting there 
So next steps over the next few months will be confirming the uh, overarching objectives and critical success factors for the project. We'll be uh, progressing the environmental baseline report and then evaluating the feedback and information that we are getting from this initial round of engagement. Um, the numerical modelling process, as I mentioned, is a, a three-stage approach, which we're just starting on now. Um, so uh, a model approach report has been produced. Once we have agreement with the Environment Agency uh, on the approach, we'll then commence the development of models and, and the validation of those uh, and again, get, gain agreement on the, on um, those models for use to support the uh, production runs of baseline um, uh, flood risk that will then feed into the damage assessment and support the option appraisal going forward. And I'll hand over to Dan to talk a bit more about the engagement side of things. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, John. That's great. Um, I'll just give a just a minute for questions actually we haven't got a slide in but if anyone does have any questions feel free to ask away now no that's great perfect so so yeah um us as the dorset case forum are leading on the stakeholder engagement for this project um, and as john mentioned we're currently in round one of this engagement um, john covered this quite thoroughly in the the previous slide so i won't go into this in too much detail um, but there are six rounds of engagement aligning with those key project stages um, so firstly this this first round we're in at the moment is looking to sort of purely raise awareness and, and look for that data to inform the future of the project um, and then moving on to stage two that will be establishing uh, what you call the baseline scenario um, so presenting those findings from from round one and looking for any additional information um, that can take that strategy forwards and then we really get into sort of the the meat of it with presenting the long list options and then honing those down to the shortlist options and then selecting the preferred options. And this is the uh, statutory consultation, uh, which will be at least three months long. Um, so this will be quite a large section of work to do. And we'll be holding lots of different events, both online and in person, um, as well as online surveys and trying to collect as much information as possible um, using these different uh, medias. And then finally, it's the, the strategy appraisal report approval stage so looking at um, the, the final approved strategy and then looking at the next steps for that and how that can be uh, sort of integrated into all of those different aspects of work so yeah we could have the, the next slide please Anna. so yeah the main objectives with engaging with stakeholders uh, throughout the project Firstly, looking to um, improve the understanding of the main issues um, for the stakeholders in the community. So making sure that these have been considered in the development of the strategy, um, particularly in looking at those risks from sort of coastal flooding and erosion. And then also understanding the, the influence of other studies um, on those preferred options. So we're trying to work with as many different stakeholders as possible. Um, as Alan mentioned, there's the, the project on the curved sea wall at uh, West Wiz, which we're working closely with uh, the Dorset Council um, FSM team on that. So all of these different projects that come into it, we're trying to, trying to take those into account and work with them on those. And then also understand the constraints and opportunities from a stakeholder perspective. So not only seeing this as something that, that has to be done and something that protects, but actually how can we benefit the community as well? And then also understanding the concerns regarding coastal flooding. Uh, I think the community in this area and the key stakeholders are quite aware of, of coastal flooding generally. Um, it's quite a, a sort of key topic in the area but trying to raise that awareness and understand those concerns in depth um, as a part of this and then as Alan mentioned understanding the potential for partnership funding and looking at those funding sources and how these works could be taken forwards uh, in the future and then also ensuring compliance with legislation and policy um, that goes back to that statutory consultation that will be done uh, in, in stage five and informing the wider community of the development of the strategy and um, so just making sure people are aware of it and aware of um, its impact on those future works and then informing the wider community of the partnership funding process so making sure that we communicate that funding clearly and as Alan mentioned sort of looking at what 
this strategy won't do as well as what it will do. And then gaining uh, specific personal or organizational views um, to make sure that the local knowledge is uh, sort of reflected and included in the strategy. Uh, we've we've met with quite a few sort of local experts and and key stakeholders so far, and we'll be looking to carry that on throughout the project. And then that will be incorporated into the strategy um, because there is so much local knowledge out there in this area. Um, so yeah, that's from from yourselves as well. So thank you for joining today and sort of giving us your feedback is yeah really essential to this project. Um, and then finally involving stakeholders in creating an implementation plan um, that's supported deliverable and suitable for the community so looking at those next steps and making sure that there's a plan in place that's involved everyone um, who's been involved throughout the process so yeah we'll have the next slide so are there any questions at this point no okay we'll move on Great, so looking at how you can help inform the strategy, um, this, as we say, is round one of engagement, uh, one of six. So we've held face-to-face -face events last week. We had two events, um, both on Portland, but we are looking to do more events in Wyke as well, uh, looking at the possible venues there. And we've obviously had today's uh, online presentation, and then we have our online survey live as well, <clears throat> which is available through our Have Your Say platform. Uh, Nikki's just kindly put a link to that in the chat um, so yeah feel free to go on there and fill that in if you haven't already um, and that website will be the main uh, place to see updates on the project and to, to keep involved with what's going on um, so if we could have the next slide please Alan yeah so there's just a quick screenshot of the the website there so you've got the project information my contact details there on the right so obviously feel free to get in touch with me um, if you have any questions or comments at all um, and we've got sort of supporting documents um, faqs and, and events and the survey will show up there as well um, so you can keep up to date with that um, and you can also register just in the top right there um, if you go to that link that will register and keep you up to date with the project that's great thanks alan so yeah, we'll be holding um, further engagement events as it develops um, and we're looking at a, a variety of formats. So looking at holding workshops with key stakeholders and um, we'll be providing briefings to Dorset Council and Portland and Weymouth Town Councils for every round of engagement, doing presentations. Um, so this is something that if you do have any community groups or um, anyone similar that you would like us to give a talk to we're more than happy to come along and give a, a similar or potentially a little bit shorter presentation uh, to those groups so alan's going along to the the white Regis society in november i believe um, to give a presentation there so yeah do get in touch if you would like us to come along um, more drop-in exhibition events as well and we're looking at the potential of doing more sort of low-key pop-up events so doing these maybe at sort of local um entertainment venues at Billy Winters um, and maybe even in some of the supermarkets as well and then the online surveys uh, through the Have Your Say platform so we're trying to access as many different avenues really um, and get as many different people's input on this as possible so we'll publicize these events um, via the project website there in the link and we'll also push them on our social media channels as well <clears throat> so you can keep up to date on there that's great thanks Alan great the final poll um so just a quick question on how you found today's event um, and looking at yeah whether you found the information too technical or, or not not enough information it really helps us sort of form a um, plan going forward so that's great perfect great oh, just about right there you go that's perfect thank you very much for that that's good to good to know when we're planning future events thanks a lot so I think that brings us to the end. So our, um, our email is on there. And again, on the, the link there on the website, which is in the chat, there's my contact details on there as well, my phone number and email. So if you do want to get in touch, feel free. Um, and I'll just open the floor to questions. If anyone has any final questions or, or comments or anything, really, feel free to come in. Uh, no questions for me, guys, but just really thank you very much for your time. It was really informative. So cheers. Yeah. Thanks, Can I just say that I, I appear to be the only member of the public that turned up for this, 
which I, I think is disappointing because it was well publicized in the echo but i found it very useful myself um and uh, i hope i can join further discussions and there'll be more people from the public joining in Mm. yeah thanks so much jeff no thank you for coming along as well and yeah we we were surprised at the at the turnout to be honest we had a few more signing up um but we we tried to publicize it as far as we could um i think often these initial rounds of engagement because it's we're not presenting anything too sort of controversial i guess um they can often be a little bit quieter than the future rounds where we're presenting options and saying to people what might be done but I think, yeah, it's, we were hoping for a few more, but no, we really appreciate you coming along and hopefully we'll get more in the future rounds as well. So, yeah, thanks a lot for, for joining. The problems might have been that the notice in the echo was quite some time ago and just people forget. So uh, That's it, yeah. It's, it's a really hard it, balance. Yeah, of. if the echo was uh, perhaps put it out just a couple of days ago, it might have been a bit better. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed that. Thanks very much. Amazing. Oh, that's great.